Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss why you need data management, getting executive buy-in, sponsored today by Summerkey. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of the session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Brett for a brief word from our sponsor, Samarki. Brett, hello and welcome. Thank you and welcome all of you out there. Great topic, one that we're excited to be participating in. So Brett Hansen, I'm the Chief Growth Officer at Samarki. Uh, Samarki is an MDM platform player. I'll spend a few minutes talking about us in a second, but before I jump into that, I want to at least acknowledge this great topic. Obviously, as an MDM vendor, we work with dozens of organizations every quarter who are going through this very question. How do we get support for MDM? Um, so we have a good perspective on how you can navigate your organization to be successful. What I'll start off with is, what is the biggest impediment? And I know everyone here knows this, so I'll be very brief here, but overwhelmingly, it's not the technology. Yes, that's difficult. It is the culture. It is the people. It is getting everyone on the same page and aligned on what it is that we're trying to achieve and ensuring that there is continuity around the business objective. So when we're engaging with prospects, many of whom, by the way, are individuals who have already launched an MDM project and that one was unsuccessful, we always start with the business. It's not the technology. That's super important. Obviously, we feel that way. But what's the business outcome that you're trying to achieve? Don is going to go into this in much more detail, but I, I thought I would just share the five steps that we talk to our prospects about. It all starts with business need. Right. What it is are you trying to achieve? The second is ensuring that there is a business sponsor. Right. Many of the individuals who come to us are on the technical side. They're data architects or data analysts, and they're they're looking for our help. And we always point back to who is the person who is going to derive the benefit from this project because you need them in the canoe with you. Third is making sure that you have a scope that's achievable. Fourth, can't stress this enough that there is an ROI business case associated with this. I would say the biggest difference between those who are successful and those who struggle are the ability to articulate a very clean business case. And then fifth, having an achievable plan that ties back into that business need. Those are the elements that we see driving the success of Greenland MBM projects. So how does Samarki play in this? Well, for those who've not heard of us, We've been around for about a decade. We are absolutely focused on securing that successful business outcome. And when anyone asks me, like, what makes Samarki different from the many MDM vendors out there, I always return to that. Well, how does that manifest itself? The first is our approach is different. And this is that Lime line here, which is we have a no-code data product tool that allows you to deliver exactly what your business needs. Yes, we have templates that can help you get started, but unlike most of the customer or other MDM players out there, we're focused on a specific set of requirements generating a specific set of application capabilities. And that's a big difference in allowing you to be successful with your stakeholders. The next is great UI UX. If the stakeholders don't like the experience, they're not going to use it, and ultimately this is going to fail. So having a compelling UI UX that's easy to use, that's easy to get adopted, is absolutely critical. And the fourth element is MDM is hard. 
it's complicated. There's lots of moving parts. There's the business requirements. There's the technology. There's all the different things you know about in terms of more data and more regulation regulations. We have a team of experts who have worked with literally hundreds of organizations like yourselves who do nothing but help them get things started. And we also have a set of assets, including something we call our rapid delivery blueprint, which we have built out that allows you to have really strong, compelling direction on how to get started. Recognizing that everyone's different, but having that focused direction can play a huge role. I think our approach really resonates in the industry. I'd call it the fact that the last couple of Gartner Magic Quadrants were top right. But to me, what's more importantly is we are overwhelming the people's choice in the Gartner Peer Insights. So I'm sure all of you have heard a thousand dinner pitches and they kind of all sound the same. I would say, go out and check us out on Gartner Peer Insights. See what your colleagues say about us in terms of how we deliver on our commitments. So getting back to the topic at hand, how can Samarki help? Limited time remaining, so I'm just gonna hit the first two items here. We can offer a very customized demo. Again, because our approach is delivering a data application for you, we can put something together in a relatively short amount of time that can really help your business owners see the value. Picture's worth a thousand words, I'd say a demo's worth a million. Really can help them fully experience the power of the solution and get their buy-in. The second is we have built an ROI tool. It is a really great tool. It's built off of IDC quantitative research of hundreds of MDM implementations. So it's got hard data behind it. We have two versions of very simple, straightforward, 10 or so questions to get you started. And then a much more sophisticated tool that you can build out as you're going through this process so you can show your stakeholders, look, here's the cost, but here's the return on this. And I've seen it be amazing help in terms of getting buy-in. So I'll be here for the rest of this, this uh, conversation. Best of luck in your efforts. And I will turn it over to Donna. Thank you so much for kicking us off with this great presentation and demonstration. If you have questions for Brett, he'll be joining us in the Q&A portion of the webinar at the end of the webinar today. And now let me introduce to you the speaker for the series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is currently the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get, begin her presentation. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon, and hello, team. <laughs> Always good to join these, and, and thanks for the uh, demo, I mean, the presentation earlier from Samarki. So to jump right in, because I know we're all here for the content, um, as we already mentioned, today is all about that elusive, or hopefully not elusive, how you get executive buy-in. I know um, if you've joined my webinar before, you know I run a small consulting company, um, and that's almost half of the requests we get of, you know, we're trying to sell our initiative and cert initiative here, you know, master data management, metadata management, data quality, you know, and, and how do you get that sold up the flagpole, as we say, and, and we do a lot of that. And I think hopefully a lot of you on the call have had success so that it can be done and, and more and more, it very often is done. Um, so if you're feeling like there's a challenge, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So um, also, if this is the first time you've joined one of these webinars, uh, this is a series. Uh, Day Diversity is really good about um, keeping all of these in perpetuity online. So you, if, if any of these earlier webinars are of interest, you can go back um, and get access to you. Uh, speaking of getting, you know, kind of buy-in and interest, AI and machine learning hasn't been hearing about that. So uh, that's next month. And then we'll get into some of the other fundamental stuff we often talk about, like data quality and metadata and all the good data management stuff. Um, and can folks still hear me? Because I just got an error message uh, cutting in and out. Yeah, um, you are. Thank I apologize. Um, we'll just keep bit. going if it gets. All right. I Is that any better? Is yeah, that not yeah, better? Yeah. And if you have anything open that you can close to, that might, that might be helpful. But yeah. Um, if it continues, I am also, I tend to... 
Oh, yeah, it's continuing. You just we just lost you. Uh, get get excited and, and move. Along. Um, I will be right back. I'm going to stop my. Yeah. Sorry. Hold on, folks. Apologies. Technical difficulties. We'll get you in just a moment. Yep. If it continues, we will do a plan B. Um, okay. Is that any better? Yes and no? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. so on to the topic at hand, and please do chime in if, because uh, I also have the bad habit of starting to pace around the room and, and move away from my laptop. So if it's something basic like that, I'll fix that. So again, today we are talking about becoming a data-driven organization. Probably again, why you're, uh, a lot of you are here, and and you know I I've been doing this for a long time now, and I always say you know back in the day I remember going to the data diversity conferences and webinars. And one of the topics was always, you know, we're not getting the attention from the business. We're, we're down there in the server room and no one cares about us. And I say, you know, be careful what you ask for, because now every company or organization or even nonprofits are be looking to become data driven. What I find is sometimes a challenge and not again, not insurmountable, which is why we have this webinar. It works all the time and it can work. But often that subtlety of data management and, and all of the stuff you do behind um the analytics and behind AI and machine learning and digital transformation, getting that sold up um, can be more difficult. And, and it, again, we'll talk a lot about this, so I don't want to steal my own thunder, but um, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily that the, the, the management doesn't care. They probably just don't understand. One of the main questions I get all the time, again, as a consultancy is, you know, I know I need to be data driven. I don't really know what that means, or I know I know data governance and I need it. But what is it like? What is it? Or I I know what it is, but I don't know how to get there. What's the roadmap to get there? Right. So those are the questions I get. Um, and so I'm going to hopefully help you uh, kind of sell or, or explain that same thing. And it's not crazy. You know, you might know. I don't know. I need to lose weight. I, though you don't need to tell me that. How do I do it? What's the best workout plan? Right. So you're almost the advisor to your execs or, you know, I I know I, I need to, I don't know, you know, keep my car maintained or my bike maintained. What do I need to do? Right. But we all have those same questions. So just apply that to data management as you're kind of selling that up the platform. But there's definitely interest. This idea of being data driven you know, we're seeing it everywhere. So on that note, we are seeing it everywhere. These are, you know, quotes I like to share. Um, and if you look, these are mostly data uh, business, you know, uh, periodicals, right? Forbes, Harvard Business Review, Wall Street Journal, yeah, CIO Journal, yes. Uh, but they're all talking about being a data-driven business. So if you have an executive asking you, how do we be more data-driven? It's because they're hearing it everywhere. And they feel like all their colleagues are, are doing this as well. And they don't want to miss out. Great place to be, perhaps a frustrating place to be as you're trying to explain you know, some of the data, uh, the details behind this. Um, if you've heard me present a similar slide in the past, you know, I get very bitter about the data scientists being the sexiest job of the 21st century. Not that any of you who are data scientists are not incredibly sexy, I'm sure, even though the cameras are not on. Um, but it's not data quality, the sexiest job, or, you know, metadata management, the sexiest job of the 21st century, right? Um, although I did have uh, a coworker, I was talking about data governance, and I've been talking about data governance probably for close to 30 years now. Um, and it was a younger individual, and they said, I know you like to use these sexy buzzwords like data governance, and I had to stop in my tracks. I'm like, I have become the sexy buzzword. <laughs> so maybe data governance is now the sexiest job of the 21st century because I am hearing more and more. But my point is that often it's the analytics and the data science and the AI that, of course, is top of mind because that's what people see, right? That literally is the face of data. Um, and we don't always look behind the curtain, which is a lot of what data architecture and data management is all about. Um, quick, before I keep going, are we still good with sound, Shannon? Yes. Or, Helps if I can unmute myself, but yeah, you sound good. <laughs> okay, you are, made me nervous. Yeah, I did good. once for a client an entire hour and I learned to ask for questions and I was done and I had dropped after about five minutes and I'm talking away. <laughs> I'll let you know last for sure. Time. So yeah, I don't want to uh, give me another call. If, uh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, so this is the, again, why we are having this webinar and why you're probably on it because more and more people are looking, hey, I want to be the next Amazon.com. I want to be the next Uber, right? How do I be data driven no matter what industry, um, either for or nonprofit or government? Um, and I, and I, on that note, I like this slide 
uh, from the World Economic Forum. Again, I use a lot of you know data-driven uh, slides and you know quotes from data diversity and, and similar periodicals. It's not too crazy to have data diversity say data is important, right? But when the World Economic Forum says something like this, and, and they did an analysis, um, if you look at the market cap from the main you know uh, companies across the globe, your Exxon's and, and your Walmart's, et cetera, whereas in 2013 the main focus of the top market cap companies were products. You know, that Walmart sells the best and cheapest and fastest and Exxon has the best market share. Now, in 2018, not, not that companies aren't selling products, but it's the data that's more valuable than actually those products, right? So some of these companies are pure data companies. Alphabet, that's Google, right? You, they are a data company. Um, so we'll talk more about that, what it means to be a data company. Some are product companies like Amazon, but what makes Amazon, so, one of the things that makes Amazon so great is their use of data. You know, the recommendation engine, you bought this, would you want to buy this? Or, you know, the, how their product data is their good old master data and how, you know, product data is organized on Amazon. I've had customers that are, I had one customer got a million dollars in fines from Amazon because their master data wasn't organized enough to sell their product effectively. So these are very real world, tangible things that are all data driven and World Economic Forum is saying it. And I'm, I'm thrilled because we've been saying it. We data people, <laughs> if you're data people on the call, have been saying that for a long time. Um, and now the rest of the world is, is, is also saying it in, in, in force. So um, I, I talked about this just now, um, what it means to be a data company. And, and I've been, I, I like this slide because it kind of talks about the difference between being a data driven company and full on being a data company. So what does that mean? So being a data-driven company, you, you might argue we've been doing this since the beginning of time. You know, I'm, I'm a big old data nerd, but I you know, went to you know Egypt years ago and was looking at the you know the the you know pet, the, you know hieroglyphs and things on the walls. And what are they doing? They're counting grain. You know, it was basically numbers. It was basically early dashboards, right? Or, or you know, you go to a lot of the ancient cultures. They've been counting things for a long time. Why? So you can sell more, sell cheaper, sell faster, and and a lot of those types of things. Um, so using data to either improve efficiency, you know, reduce redundancy, manual efforts, or, or grow revenue, or support your patients better, or whatever, optimizing your organization is that what I would call business op optimization. Data is great for that. And this also, and I would say this is growing and maybe didn't exist so much in the past, of actually being a data company. And I'm working for more and more clients that, you know, on the wall is we are a data company, or we're looking to be a data, where data is more the, the product, or you're monetizing your, your data um, for new value, or, you know, it could also be research and things like that, open data sets from government and things where really your per, first order job is, is data, or something like a, maybe a, an Uber, right, or a, a Google, where, where you're not just really literally selling data, but, you know, Uber is built off really good data, and, and yes, they're, a, I guess, a taxi company, but really that's a, you know, they are almost a data first idea you know can we take data from airplane and arrivals and traffic patterns and get to get the right person at the right there at the right time I and mean, that really is a new business model that is your true digital transformation where data is really driving the business so hopefully that's helpful some i i work with a lot of companies on the left not everybody needs to be on the right um and i worked with one manufacturing company that wanted to be in both right they did a lot of manufacturing for the um building industry which kind of go up and down based on the market and they wanted something to mitigate that. So they, they actually took some of the data from the trucks. They had big um, trucks that were delivering data in, in rural areas in Latin America. Um, and not, not a lot of people did, did that, but the people who did really needed that information of can a truck of this weight go over this bridge or under this tunnel um, and things like that. Um, and they sold that to some other people in the industry, almost like uh, Google maps for shipping and transportation of big trucks. Um, and that was a, you know, was a massive part for, at that point of their revenue, but it was a new revenue driver based on the data they already had under the hood in their own company because they had their sensor. They were using sensor data on the left to improve the efficiency of their drivers. How fast do they drive? How much gas do they use? Do they get there on time? And then they said, hmm, we're optimizing our business with the data. Can we also now use that to be data-driven? So, um, that was one example, um, but they are kind of di different things. But um, but but think when when your boss is saying we need to look at data, or your your executive, you know which one is in their head, or can you suggest ideas maybe on the right that the, fo uh, the folks haven't thought of, right? So that's kind of why that's important to this conversation. 
So we talked about the data-driven business, um, and I will now quote, I, I, I quoted the uh, World Economic Forum, I'll now quote data diversity, um, and global data strategy and data diversity do every year now, uh, um, kind of a, a trends and data management report, which is always fun. Um, and I like some of these analytics, which is, you know, definitely over half of folks um, are look seeing data as a strategic asset. Um, I would say, little nuance to that question. If you said, do we want to be data driven, it would probably be higher. I think asset means, are you treating it in a way that's managed effectively, which is why it isn't probably 100%, it's a little lower there, right? But if you look at the why, and we'll go more into that, a lot of folks want that good old fashioned reporting and analytics, right? That tends to be the face of your dashboard, I mean, of your company. I want to know, you know, are we increasing sales? Are we helping our uh, patients and our students? And are we saving costs and that kind of thing, which leads us to the second, you know, trying to be more efficient is a big reason why folks are kind of looking at data and, and, and dashboards and, and data management is great at kind of driving that efficiency. Um, and the digital transformation is a big part of that. And, and that's another buzzword. What does that mean? We'll go a little into that. Um, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Again, I want to sell my product data online. I was a brick and mortar store. I want to go digital, do a digital transformation. If I don't have my product data organized in a, in a great way and I don't have good master data for my products, I can't sell it online, right? Or I want to do all digital marketing campaigns. And we did this for a big insurance company. They didn't have email addresses for their customers and they didn't have, you know, they, so they really couldn't do some of these digital campaigns that they wanted to. So, um, so some of the key drivers that might be interesting. So it isn't more about digital transformation. I, I use a lot of definitions in my presentations because we're data people and we love our definitions. Um, this one's from Gartner. Um, and um, I just thought that this was a good way to kind of clarify that, you know, there's a lot of different definitions out there, but really, um, it really is how do we optimize our existing organization to be more, I guess, digital, <laughs> uh, you know, syllogism there. But um, I, I do differentiate a little bit, that, and I would differ when they are, or push back on them a little bit when they say it's, it's used as public sector organizations for modest initiatives like putting services online or legacy modernization. If you've been when when it went through one of those, those are kind of big deals. And every time I renew my driver's license online, I thank the person who went digital in Colorado because actually that those are, actually, but they can't go digital online if they don't have a good, good, good view of their citizen data, right? And is it protected and is it secure and all of that. A lot of digital transformation is driving data man. that connection to your execs of why, and hopefully I gave you some examples now, why digital transformation is one of my webinars. We're losing you a bit, Donna. Yeah. Uh, 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 is it better now? It is. Okay, thank you. Time it again if it, it happens again. Uh, apologies. Um, but why this one is particularly germane to this conversation um, is it really time, and again, because we do, I do this day in and day out, um, and why I have an unstable uh, connection right now is I'm on client Wi-Fi, because <laughs> we're literally in a workshop on this right now that I stepped out of, um, where really aligning first that business strategy with your data strategy, and that seems so trite until you actually do it, right? If once you get execs to understand that, yes, I want to sell more products online, and to do that, I need metadata management, right? Which probably isn't top of mind when your exec said, unless I've done it at another company, which is more and more common. Um, and, and often a lot of these drivers that we see that support your business and data strategy, like governance, like master data, like data quality, when execs ask for them, it's because they've done it successfully somewhere else. We're, we're, we're at company A selling widgets and they're at, you know, they said, well, when I was at widget company B, we had mastered it and we had to, and this stuff worked. Why don't we have it here? <laughs> They're often your best advocates and you'll probably find them somewhere in the organization. So that's nice for us as data professionals that the best sales for data is that it works somewhere else, right? It shows that the product is good, <laughs> but what went done well, right? Every, every, you know, every in industry has failures and not that everything is per every data governance initiative is perfect, right? But when it works well, people come back asking for more. Why? Because it makes them more, efficient. Um, again, just stepped out of a workshop now. Where we're trying to argue what what do you even mean by total revenue? And are we all saying it the same way across the globe? And how can we run our business unless we all agree? Absolutely. That is, you know, business-driven data strategy. And that's an easy way to sell up to execs. And the execs are on the call and they were the first ones to chime in 
of why we were here in the morning, right? We can't run an efficient organization and sell more stuff more efficiently and help our customers unless we get our data right through governance. And that was the, you know, the chief financial officer that kicked off our call. So if you doubt that this stuff happens, it does. And hopefully some of these tips um, here. So again, I, I was long-winded on that slide a little, um, but again, the more you tie your data strategy, or your data management with the, the, with the organization of the business. And, I, and I've used very kind of retail type examples, but we do this all the time. You can't help your patients unless you have a secure patient portal and you can't help your students if you don't even know the definition of a student. Is it online students or just, you know, just or folks that go on campus, right? So any industry, we can't be a nonprofit unless we understand our members of the nonprofit and how we can help our constituents and things like that. It isn't just retail, it's just kind of easy to, think of <laughs> products and widgets because we all think of that, but right. So hopefully throughout this example, um, and, and we'll talk of different ways, but examples always work too, right? Data quality seems really nebulous until management sees that the numbers are wrong or they see how data quality affects their bottom line, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll kind of refer back to some of these, but um, we use this all the time and it kind of helps stress uh, some of these examples. Also, once you get this right, you may show this type of thing to a an exec, and they don't have to know all the details of what, I don't know, uh, data quality management and the dimensions of data quality. They just kind of know that they need it as a pillar to support all the cool stuff they want to do, right? So getting that right level of, um, you know, conversation to the right people, we'll, we'll talk more about as well. Okay, um, moving on. And that kind of talks to that balance. And, and, and so, you know, data management sometimes, and we are all to blame, I think, <laughs> in data management, can get a bad rap of, of just being, oh, we, we can't do that, you know, data management. It's just going to take too long and it's too unwieldy. And you use these big words that I don't understand. And maybe, I mean, in, in the day, you know, do you need a fully attributed enterprise logical data model before you can put your products online? No. Um, do you ever need one of those? But do you need a data model to know your product hierarchy? Yes. And, and I would argue how, you know, Amazon is going to have a good data model, right? And you have to map to it if you're going to sell, you know, so yes, you need data models. Do you need to take three years to build them? No. And do they need to be um, relevant? Yes, right? Because if you're too academic and nothing gets done, and, I, and I've worked for these companies, they have a, you know, perfect enterprise architecture and data architecture and everything's documented, but no one does anything. They're just documenting it. Not great, um, but probably even more common you don't want to do nothing, right? And just say, oh, no, we got to go sell stuff. So we can't actually plan anything. We just got to go run, right? <laughs> and, and that's chaotic as well. So the right answer is the right, and this is vague, but the right amount of data management that offers the right business value. And it really is different, right? Are you selling widgets and, and you need good product data and you need good customer data and suppliers and well, already that's getting big, right? Or are you, I don't know, a medical device testing company and we really need data accuracy, right? Or you know, a, a top secret, you know, military development thing that we absolutely can't make a mistake. Then may, maybe you're going to be a little bit more on the left, or you are an academic organization and you you need a lot of level of detail, right? So I can't answer where you need to be exactly on that spectrum. You can, but I think when you're wondering, and then I always, you know, if you've been in one of my training courses or you've been one of my clients, I always say, you know, when people say, well so what or why do i need this rather than getting frustrated by that answer it and i've done that myself do we need to be doing this if not let's put that off but you know often the answer is yes we need to be doing this because this is core to what we're doing so kind of a maybe lighthearted way to think about it but often in your own head um you know i tend to lean towards the left because i uh, i've left <laughs> Not politically that's beyond the topic of this call <laughs> where i sit there but um you know in terms of being you know really heavy on the data management because that's what I like to do. But I, even in my own company, I'm like, do we really need to be cleansing all this data or is it good enough fit for purpose for what we're trying to do? Um, and again, more often, um, we often see people not doing enough. <laughs> so you want to get, you know, and making that case, which is why we're here. The other thing to think of, and again, a lot of this is on selling. How do you sell? How do you present? How do you convince other people? So we're putting on our, you know, our marketing hat really here. You're either your organization or your audience, are they thinking more offense of, I don't know, I'm a Silicon Valley startup and I'm in growth phase and what are the folks talking about and profitability, revenue, we're going to be big, we're going to have the best customer satisfaction, we're going to win. Definitely offense. You don't want to go in and go, well, 
you know, there may be some data type errors in your customer mailing list. You know, you're going to be, they're going to push you out of the room, right? Um, at the same token, you might be a very defense type. You might be a highly regulated financial industry, or you're working with patient data or students or um, insurance is another one that tends to be very kind of defense oriented and be like, well, yeah, I know we get secured customer uh, patient data for you know, cancer research on the, we'll just put it on the web and share it all with people's names and social security numbers. Like that's crazy too, right? So, and you just want to, th and, and then sometimes even within the organization, right? Maybe that Silicon Valley startup that I talked about that wants to be big and grow, I bet you legal um, is probably a little more on the defense or, you know, the, the, the different, but maybe sales is more than the offense, right? So you might be very, you know, conservative insurance company and sales might be more in the offense, right? So just think of that because not that I've ever made a mistake, but had I ever made a mistake in a presentation, it's that you might tell by my tone of voice, I tend to lean on that left side of things here of being more on the offense and then, oh, we're going to be big and data's fun and all that, but you don't want to, again, you know, belittle some of the serious, you know, fines and regulation and things like that. And that's often where data management kind of fits. So just think of that as you're giving your voiceover for why we need data management. You know, is it all about we want to improve profitability and revenue and customer satisfaction? Or is it, hey, we just had a breach or, hey, we need to protect our citizen data or, pay, or you know, student data and we want to get that balance right, et cetera. Or, you know, there's HIPAA or Sarbanes-Oxley or, you know, it's FERPA, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Just think of that. And you're, you're probably somewhere in that purple zone where it's a little bit of offense, a little bit of defense. Just think through that as you're giving your kind of your pitch for this. So uh, the other way of thinking of offense and defense, if yeah, I like to say is that that carrot and the stick, right? Um, and the carrot is, hey, the, think of all the opportunity we're going to, again, I'm using retail again, but, you know, sell more widgets to customers because we'll have great campaigns and we know product usage because it's internet enabled because we've been digital and we can see which features customers use and we're going to be huge. Or is it defense? You know, well, yeah, but, you know, we have GDPR and we can't use certain information or it's student data. Is it is it moral to be sharing, you know, a student's grades or, you know, social issues with somebody else or, you know, and we should be more cautious. Um, and you want to think about that as you go through. So I'm going to bring up another data diversity. This is still that trends in data management. We actually asked that question. Why are you doing data management? Probably a good thing to ask in a survey. So probably no surprise. We've, we've talked a lot about kind of BI and analytics and AI being the face of data management, because that's kind of what people are using to literally run their organization. Absolutely. Number one, um, Standing can remind me, I think we've been doing this six or seven years now. It's always number one. Like, and, and that's probably no surprise. People are looking to data to drive decisions. And, and we talked about master data in the beginning of the session. You know, things like operational data, like master data, really help. One of the number one ways to sell master data management is that once you get that right, you are so much more efficient. Your product data runs, your customer data runs, your suppliers are known, and you don't have risk. Um, absolutely a great way to sell that as well as everything else, right? So there's also that operational component. We talked about digital transformation and then there's that, you know, complying with regulation and risk. Those are definitely kind of the stick. You can read some of the others. I actually like how some of these have bubbled up. You know, some of them are not just selling more widgets, but things like improving outcomes. We have better education or better health outcomes for our you know, constituents and things like that. So that's nice to see as well that it isn't always just about selling more widgets or, you know, nothing wrong with selling widgets because we all use widgets, but um, it just shows that data management is now across so many industries now. Um, everybody's, everybody is doing it because it's valuable. So we're going to talk a bit more about, I guess I'll name the kind of the Burbank carrot stick index or indices that we can kind of go through each year and see, but um, I found it interesting that this was from folks that say, what is driving their business? And I just kind of did what, what would be considered a carrot and what would be more of on the stick side. So I think complying with regulations and reducing risk, so pretty much clearly a stick. No one gets up really excited and goes, you know, we are going to comply with regulations better than anyone in the end. I mean, you might, but it's not really this forward going thing. Maybe saving costs and increasing efficiency, you might say is a stick, but I don't know. I That sells a lot for even just when I'm trying to sell something like master data management that can be really complex and sound hard and sound 
kind of academic or obtuse or whatever, I talk about the efficiency play to a company that is that Silicon Valley startup trying to grow. They get that. Oh, if I can't, I can't grow faster. I can't be more efficient without something like master data. Like that's almost the easiest way to sell master data management. And it is true. It also helps reporting and analytics. Like how do I report on customer growth if I don't know who my customers are, blah, blah, blah. So uh, both of those. So you, you could maybe argue that saving cost is a stick, but I, I definitely see it as a carrot because that's definitely a carrot to execs that are trying to, you know, grow. Maybe cost could be, you know, we're, we're downsizing. We need to, you know, save costs, but being more efficient definitely helps with growth. So why do I talk about this other than I like my little pictures of carrots and things? Um, there's a mindset. And I've noticed this, and maybe I'm being a little judgy, but <laughs> different personalities kind of generally go to different jobs, right? So think of a salesperson. They, by definition, are full on carrot. Everything's big, everything's bold. And, you know, because who wants to sell, buy something from someone who's like, well, our product's kind of crap and you don't really probably want to buy it, but you could, you know, <laughs> they're just by definition kind of because they need to be very, you know, we're going to be bigger, better, faster. We as IT, and I'm putting myself in that category, or data management, are kind of paid to find and fix problems, right? So we sometimes sound like the Debbie Downers of, well, I know you want to be bigger and better, but have you thought about GDPR and there's data quality issues? And I'm not saying you're not right, but that's often how we come across. So when you're selling to management oh, or your execs are getting buy-in, the more we can kind of add that carrot flavor, because that's well, again, think of your company. Again, if you're if you're talking to your regulatory board or you're talking to legal or, you know, think of what kind of company you're in, you may very well lead with, hey, we're going to get a fine if we're not, you know, complying with the regulation. That is a fine way to sell data management. And often, even with that, you know, people get more excited about the carrot. So if you find yourself kind of being the you want to be also realistic, and we'll talk about that when we get into the roadmap. Um, but I just you know, I thought this kind of talked to it as well. Um, in that we tend to kind of lead with the carrot. You know, why are you doing this? It's kind of the fun stuff, right? <laughs> that reporting and analytics and saving and transforming and digital, being more digital and that kind of thing. So on that note, you know, what I sort of talk through, what is your perspective when you think this? Do you maybe have to temper that when you're giving your presentation? Do I tend to look for the problems? Because that's what my company's paying me to do is find data quality problems. And you can lead data quality is often a very good way to send, sell that. But is that sometimes projecting that I can look at like a glass half empty instead of a glass half full type of person? And if I'm selling to sales, maybe I want to do that glass half full um, type of thing um, with, with some realism. So um, just something I've noticed as we present a lot and sometimes coming in, uh, talking to management, they kind of almost have that bias of you guys are the ones that are always telling me it's too hard to whatever, or I'm doing something wrong, or I'm bad, or I can't, 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 can't. We just want to be careful. We're not kind of doing that. Or are we jaded because we tried this before, right? There was one of my uh, clients that had kind of been jaded and they were going to sell. And I just, and again, we were talking freely and openly and we always have to do the vent, you know, <laughs> and by ourselves. And I, I just kind of cautioned them and it did work of, are you letting a little bit of that? It's been tried too many, you know, temper or jade your presentation that, you know, now that you've tried it, we kind of have to put all that behind you and sound positive again. Right? <laughs> Think of a salesperson. They almost train. I've been to probably too many sales training in my life from previous jobs. Um, it's always that, you know, how many doors have been slammed in your face and then you got to try that one more customer who's going to buy. That's like, that's how they're trained. So, yep, maybe you tried MDM selling or data quality selling last year. Just think of how you can sell it now. And just keep that positive. I'm, fe I'm feeling luxury, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. But it's something I've kind of noticed, and I found myself is, you know, I'd be back in the days when I was doing way more hands-on stuff. You know, I've spent all night trying to get the data warehouse right, and, and you have the dashboard ready. And there was that one thing that wasn't working. And I'm giving the presentation of this new, great, awesome thing. And what do I start with? And I would kick myself, the thing that wasn't working, because that, that's what was top of mind, because I was just, and we do that, right? Because I was like so involved in how do I fix that problem? And I had to learn that myself, Donna, stop that and focus on the 90% of the cool new stuff that is right, right? And, and, and focus on that. So it's just kind of a casualty of what we do for a living. So on that note, um, if you are that kind of data-driven professional who wants to be more on that on the quote the business side and have a seat at the table and all that stuff we were talking about being data-driven and digital and and being part of those cool projects, like the time is now for you. Like again, I do this for a living, so I get this kind of naturally. But people are 
I've found execs are dying for someone who can explain this stuff to them in a way that they understand. And wouldn't we all, like just life is complicated. What, what are the folks say now, this adulting, right? Could somebody, when I have a legal problem, explain a lot of me in an easy way or gosh, the difference between a, a Roth and a traditional 401k that doesn't make me feel stupid. I just don't know that yet because I'm new and I've never had a 401k before or something, right? Or my car or my, you know, new piece of digital equipment or something, right? We all don't want to feel dumb. And there's a lot of things I would love to have that person that could explain everything to me. And so data, because it is, can be complicated and is so important and execs want someone that can have that become almost their trusted advisor. So if this is something you want to do, great time for you um, because it's a lot of people who want to hear what you have to say. And so I am being a little luxury today, uh, but again, I'm talking half to myself because I, I hopefully learned a lot of these things myself. We, if you're a data architect on the call, you, you can, you can maybe uh, insert other data data professions here. I just think that architects are kind of unique in that we're very, I'm putting all the same to myself, very nerdy and love the technical stuff, but also are kind of verbose and want to talk about it. So I really think my friends want to hear about a database being in third normal form. And I get all excited and I use all these techie terms like, oh, please, I want to show you my data model and all the detail. And, and, and the guy in the middle who just needs to, you know, quota done like that lady or that guy with the beard is pretty weird. You might wonder what about that picture, right? But it's like the, the person on the sidewalk saying, the world's going to end, you know, and, and they're walking around with a sign. And he, he may be right. The world is going to end. According to astronomers, the world will end. Walking around in a robe with a sign you know, on your chest is not going to convince people. They're going to think you're weird. And sometimes when we get so into the tech and talk about things like normalization and dimensional models and, you know, all of those techie words, um, we lose the business, right? Not that we're not right and not that it's not important. So how do we go from a data architect or data management professional or data scientist, or data engineer, insert your role here, here, to more of a data advisor, right? And that's kind of the point of this presentation of, you know, rather than saying your language, third normal form, you know, whatever, <laughs> um, be more of a data advisor. How can you help them? What is in it? Rather than get frustrated, well, all the sales wants to know is what's in it for them. I say, answer, what is in it for them? Why is what you're saying important? So, hey, if we could link your customer data with your product use and stats, we could help you increase sales. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. Well, here's how we could join this data with this data and slice and dice. And that's still facts and that's not their form was dimensional, right? But it's, it's techie stuff, but you're saying it in a way that means something to them. And that's just, it's just kind of a mental switch. And I, I still catch myself after doing this for about 30 years, jumping into the tech because it's what I love, but starting with what they care about and then adding a why, super, super important. Um, and before you judge people for not wanting to be more data literate and, and all of that, um, we do the same thing, right? So here's the guy with a, you know, third normal form sign on the sidewalk telling everybody, um, and he, his paycheck is late. So he goes to a, the accounting department and says, I need my paycheck. And they're like, well, you know, we recently switched from cash-based accounting to accrual-based accounting to opt -out. He's like, I don't, I don't care, nerd. I just want my paycheck, right? Same thing. The business just wants their dashboard. And they may need to know a few things to build that dashboard. We don't need to teach them data management. Um, I was at the DGIQ conference a couple weeks ago or whatever it was, um, one of Shannon's conferences. And I listened to a really good session on that. And what the speaker said was, you know, data literacy is fine, but, but don't turn it into we have to teach the business what we do for a living. We're still there to enable the business. And I, I guess that's what this slide in a maybe more facetious way says of, you know, accountants, they do a lot. They're as nerdy as we are. Full on, a lot of accountants go to data management. There's a lot of similar thinking. I'm the last person that really want to know what they do. I want the books to be right. And I want my paycheck. And I want, you know, I know I have to submit my timesheets. And that's about it like that. Yes, maybe I'm a finance steward because I submitted a, I'm sorry, expense report, right? I, I don't really need to know much more than that. So similarly, your data stewards or your business or people like that don't necessarily know everything you need to do. You need to simplify it just like finance does for you. We don't know everything they do. And I honestly don't care. I'm glad they do care, right? So that's probably how most people feel about us in data management. So Ah, uh, Shannon always kind of teases me about my elevator pitch, but everything in life, the older I get, is an elevator pitch. You're always selling something to someone. I literally, what in my first job, had this uh, thing happen to me, where the the you know, idea of an elevator pitch is you meet the CEO in the elevator, and they ask what you do, or you're trying to sell something. What happened to me? I was about 22. 
I think my answer was, oh, you know, made a fool out of myself. I just did, I was so nervous. I didn't probably say anything and probably tripped over my feet walking out. But the idea is you meet the CEO in the, in the elevator and you want to sell her on your new product. You want to buy, you know, start this new data management, right? What do you do, Joe? Well, I'm working on a project to rationalize metadata across data sources to ensure con- you've lost her bored nerd, get on my, my, my elevator or my lift, right? But if instead you took that opportunity and you had done your research and you know what is important to the company and it's, hey, if to support your big online marketing campaign, I'm working on a project to get more complete view of customer. Now she's in, now she's bought. And then maybe you bring up the metadata or master data word, right? But you, what, what, what changed? One change, and we all do this, um, is instead of putting our project first, you put her project first, right? She's working on a marketing campaign. You're working on data to support that. And it's not necessarily that you're selfish. It's just that's what's top of mind, our own stuff. Like think of that example when I was trying to fix the dashboard late at night, that, that was what was on my mind. I wasn't a bad person, but I forgot to think from the other person's view. When I, if you've done a workshop with me, I always do, it's almost like a little mini shark tank I do. And, and people give very good presentations, but 90% of people always start with, we're going to do a data, data warehouse or a data lake or a data mesh or a data whatever to support. Um, and I think my original slide actually had that too. If we think of what we're doing first, no one cares. They want to think of what they're doing first. It's just even just fl- doing that flip can help. You want to do this person A. I'm going to help you do it by the things that I do well. And th- again, these are all maybe obvious or little things, but the combination of all these things is how we have successfully sold a bunch of stuff to, to, to exec. So just hopefully some of these tools in the toolkit uh, will be helpful to you. Um, so moving on again, these are all just kind of things that again have helped me. If one of these things helps you as you go. So I talked about, you know, I, I'm a big fan. If you've noticed, a lot of these slides are similar. Just that balance. How do I balance the conversation? Is it offense? Is it defense? Is it really academic data management, heavy data management, light data management? What's just enough? The other one is, is it heart or verse, or is it a head? <laughs> and what does that mean? We all love anecdotes. We all love examples, right? But there's a spectrum there as well. Right, so I am a nonprofit, and I'm trying to help children who have cancer, um, you know, have a place to stay while they're in the hospital or something like that. If, if I'm trying to sell to that CEO, and I'm like, well, we could save more money, and 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 I don't know, maybe that would just feel tacky. Yes, you have to be, but but if it was more, well, hey, we can help more children, and think of Johnny who we helped last year and his family, and you know, that's just it's a it's a mission driven organization, or even a product company, my widget. We're gonna have the best widget editor, and they're just so really bought into their widgets. That's really what drives them. It's the heart of passion and emotion. Or, you know, I I don't know, I don't want to judge any company, but you know, you're a, I don't know, I'm a, uh, I, I do, you know, I'm an under underwriter or, you know, something that I'm, I'm, or I'm the finance team and I need to really focus on profitability, kind of talking about the heart of, about that. Or, or even someone who is, I was with an academic organization, uh, it was a university. And I was telling anecdotes and gosh, that was the worst thing to do. They said, you know, they were the, um, the, the basically the evaluation team. And they said anecdotes, you know, everyone has an anecdote. We go on numbers, right? So I kind of made a fool of myself because they wanted to see numbers, right? Am I presenting to finance, um, right? Or, or the, you know, the, the insurance team that, you know, the pricing, the policies, or am I talking to the head of, you know, client support for a nonprofit helping children with cancer, right? You really want to think that through. Um, and what everyone likes the stories, um, but what, what, because the, the but do the, how much do they need to be backed up by numbers, right? And, and you don't want to kind of go, you know, on uh, the other end of the spectrum as well. If it's a, you know, a, a bank, you know, and yes, you want to probably help people who get your loans and things, but I would, I would assume a financial institution is very much more going to be in those facts, figures, numbers. And yes, hopefully we can help more people get loans and have houses and things, but starting your whole, you know, pitch on John who just bought a house and, and how his family's happy and all that, you might look kind of silly if they really want to see uh, facts and figures. So again, just another thing to think of, probably like every other organization, you're somewhere in the brown, you know, the most mission-driven nonprofit still needs to, you know, I had one nonprofit, their mantra was you can't do the mission without the margin. You know, you can have a mission, you still need numbers. And then even company, even, that's not bad, but, you know, companies that are very numbers-driven are, all have a mission as well, right? Or, or to help understand those numbers, you use an anecdote or a story, you just want to back it up. But again, something to think through. 
Um, the thing is to think about, talk to a lot of different people. This is a slide from a picture from one of my books. Um, but when, again, when we come in as a consultancy, we do a lot of interviews and we talk across business, we talk across IT. One of the first questions we ask is, let's see an org chart. And are we talking to finance and marketing and analytics and product development, et cetera, et cetera. And then across all levels from execs down to people, you know, in the field, hands on, because you're all going to get different perspectives and they all care about data but in different ways. And then you'll see people who don't. Usually it's a smaller percentage, but you can tell by body language are they bought in or not? Are they going to be an ally or, or something else? So um, you really need to get that perspective and, and have, again, what the CEO is going to talk about. Think of, did you read the annual report? Do you know what they care about? You know, the person trying to put data into SAP, do you understand SAP and what their challenges might be with drop-down lists and things like that, right? Um, so you really need that holistic view. The other area, and this is human nature, again, I, I'm feeling judgy on this call, um, but it's just advice that I've all done my by mistake myself. Um, when we're trying to push our data management um, initiative, we all kind of want to win. Like this is our thing. And I just won because I, bought, I got buy-in for a big new data initiative for the rest of the year. So much better if somebody else either comes with you or you want the team to be winning, right? It's a team sport. Data management is a team sport. One of my most successful presentations to sell to the C-level, I didn't give, right? I was a consultant. I came in. One of our big um, supporters was marketing. We had marketing give the presentation and they said, our campaigns would be so much better. We support this. I didn't say a word. We got the buy-in, right? Because it showed that somebody else cares. So think of that, of who else can be your voice. Uh, we worked for a big oil and gas company. It was Jim. He used to be out in the rigs and he talked to all those guys and he and gals and he, he knew their language. Um, and he was the best advocate. We didn't say a word. So, you know, the more you get it right, everyone's going to be talking to the data talk. So don't feel like you have to quote own it, you know, right? There should be other people really embracing it. Um, the other thing is you look for your business value. What are those levers or, or levers, right? What are the high value things? I had a boss that always said, you know, don't rearrange the deck chairs in the Titanic. You know, should be, uh, what is the big thing that everyone's caring about that you can kind of tie into? Um, it should be obvious. And how could data really be the fulcrum to help that? better marketing campaigns through customer, et cetera. In general, having done this a lot, your business case is gonna fall into one of these four categories in some way. Decreasing, decreasing costs, we talked a lot about that. Maybe we don't give ourselves enough credit for that. Are people doing manual efforts? That's probably the easiest one, right? And if they didn't do that, you'd save their salary into doing things more productive. Um, and we can save that money or inefficient mailings or whatever, all that type of thing. Inefficient processes for master data management is a big one. So, so much easier in a lot of ways to show that decrease in cost. You can also quantify increasing revenue, price optimization, better marketing campaigns. Some of, we had one, a better grant writing or, or better, we did a data cleanup um, and we were able to show the next day, next year, the donors of those cleansed addresses gave $100,000 more. And that was like direct from data cleanup. So just think of, and do it ahead of time because it's hard to quantify after the fact when you didn't have the before case. So, you know, get some of these numbers. So. Decreasing cost, increasing revenue, absolutely. Uh, reducing risk, do we always think of that? You know, not only the regulations we talked about, DPR, HIPAA, et cetera, but you know, we work with a food company and if they can't track the lineage of where that data came from, which was data, it could be sued or litigation or health and safety or privacy, right? That's another big one. And just protect, protecting reputation, who's gotten a, you know, uh, you know, Donna Boobanks, you know, you're a valued customer or, you know, my name wrong entirely or insert customer name here in quotes, you know, and, and, and you've, yeah, I might still buy the product or, you know, it's, it's hard to quantify, but we all know that you kind of lost trust, right? Um, in the same sense, if you really understand that customer and, and you really get that customer loyalty. And so those are kind of the four cases. Don't forget though, the risk of doing nothing Often when I, you know, ask folks, what, what's the biggest challenge you're going to face to like apathy, right? <laughs> Status quo, inertia. Um, but often, you know, showing, and that's why also doing that case on the before, how much do we you and wait on wasted labor, wasting it, you know, how much revenue are we not getting? How much could we have risk, you know, that we could get with a GDPR fine or how, how silly are we going to look if we're in the newspaper or, or send out a mailing or some email that doesn't make sense, right? So definitely include that as well. Um, and don't forget to align with the organizational vision. And when I was younger, maybe I was just jaded as younger. You know, you have these quotes on the walls of, and I'm like, oh gosh, that's just, you know, ju just, you know, corporate saying things. Well, maybe that's the main thing everyone's thinking of, right? I often get when I say align with the business strategy, people are saying, well, we don't have one. 
And I would question that. Have you read the annual report? Generally, I know my consultants get sick of me saying that. Yes, Donna, we run the annual report. They bullet out what their goals are for the year. It's about growth or growth in Europe or growth in Latin America, whatever, right? Or you can just kind of, if, if they don't have a formal data strategy, a business strategy, maybe because you are a startup, they don't have time for that. We can probably figure it out. They're trying to sell more product, right? So you, you or I don't know, they're really busy because we're a nonprofit and we're trying to help more kids with cancer. Like, duh, think about it. Um, so yes, it might not be a formal business strategy. You often do. Have you looked for it? And then if not, can you kind of infer uh, kind of what, what the business is looking to get or the organization? Maybe a funny picture. <laughs> I, I kind of got this one uh, from a, a, a customer who, you know, we all want to be that u unicorn, right? And, and, you know, I'm the, definitely the class half full of what new cool stuff can we do? Um, we don't want to be the dinosaur because, you know, that's kind of outdated. You're the old mainframe product that people are trying to migrate off of. Nothing wrong with mainframes. Um, but one client said to me, he's like, well, what about, you know, keeping the lights on? And what did they say about cockroaches? You know, even, even with a nuclear winter, cockroaches are going to be there, right? So the more that you're just shown as an operational, we have to actually have mass data is needed in order to have our product being sold. You know, maybe the cockroach, not as sexy, but definitely the place to be. And that's kind of your BAU or business as usual. Not a bad place to be. So. When you, the other thing I've found when I'm trying to sell to my execs, great, I talked probably too much, I've been told that, about the vision and the mission um, and, and buying in. I will, I'm not talking too much about the vision, I just talk too much in general, right? But um, don't, that's probably the most important thing, which is why I spend a lot of time on it. And what also helps sell, and you don't spend a lot of time on it, but just showing to management that you've put the roadmap together because if they've got the buy-in, great, how long is that going to take, right? And so you have to show not only the vision, I'm, I'm going to climb Everest. Yes, I'm all psyched. We're going to be the first data management professionals to sever, summit Everest. Then how do you get there? And if you do get the excitement for management and then, then show you don't have the plan, you lose some credibility. So what I always do is have the presentation with all the buy-in and just kind of quickly show, and hey, we have a project plan. It's probably going to take six to eight months or whatever it is. And if you are to go ahead, we've thought this through, just adds a lot of credibility. So, you know, make it realistic. Are there other, two, two things, are there other initiatives going on you want to tie into? Hey, we're going to have a big marketing launch. Also means people are kind of busy. Um, but, you know, I've had several projects just in this year where people initially said, oh, we can't start this because we're doing a big digital transformation and people are too busy. And we flipped that script and said, how can you do a digital transformation without data management? So we're here to help. And again, a lot of this, in my, all of the stuff I'm talking about might be stuff you're already doing. Is there just a tweaking to the wording? Like, yes, you're busy. We're here to help. Can be much more, much more better. Gosh, much better than, hey, it's another project you need to start. Right. So just think that through. Definitely have this, though, in your back pocket or front pocket if you're trying to kind of get buy in. Culture eat strategy for breakfast. This is going to be an initiative. What is your culture? Are people already bought in or do you have to go into what's called almost an organizational change management? What we tend to do is data people jump right into knowledge. Right. Um, let's talk about cost base versus accrual based accounting. You know, our version of that in data management. No one cares until you make them aware. Right. All that stuff I talked about in the beginning. Because you want to sell more product or help more patients, that's why you need, and then you go into the knowledge. And a lot of us, myself included, jump right into the data model or right into the data quality statistics or whatever it is before you do those first two. Are people even aware and why would they be interested and excited? So to summarize, you're in a great place if you're interested. A lot of people want to be more data driven, but you to explain that to people who aren't data people, use their language, have a clear selling point and a clear plan to get there and don't forget the people side it's a big as much of a culture change as anything else so um please join us in the rest of the the sessions this year we do this for a living if you need any help and with that i'm going to open it up for questions over to shannon then we have just a couple of minutes here but um i wanted to get one too that came in uh while brett was speaking uh so on mdm can we have a master model definition planned well before implementing MDM? You can. Um, it, it's one of those where you can start by understanding what's the data that you need to master, what are the domains it sits in, what are you trying to achieve, and then from there you can actually implement. So there's nothing wrong with starting off with that plan as a starting point before you actually get a full implementation. Awesome. Anything you want to add there, Donna? No, I agree. And I sort of ended on that. You know, having a plan is half the selling point, right? Really understand what you need to do. Um, so, yeah. 
All right. Okay, so I'm going to slip in one more question here just so we get some time. It's a, in decentralized operating model, does the data management and data strategy lie within the site, the decentralized unit? Go ahead, Donna. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a big one. Um, both, I, I suppose. I guess the risk of you know, the risk of centralizing everything is that it feels like everyone needs to make that central decision. You definitely want a decentralized model have some decision points in the, the, the spokes, I guess, of the hub. So that's a good model. Um, but certain things like master data have to go through that center because they're used by all the spokes, I guess is the bigger thing. And so I think there's a bit of a trend lately to kind of over decentralize and that's a risk too. So getting that right balance is probably the key thing. But Brett, anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, balance is key. What I would say is we find a lot of different functions who are running their own MDM projects. Now they're doing so in collaboration with the centralized organization. So it's not drunk and disorderly, but given, you know, marketing has a set of discrete needs and that CMO needs to get those met. They can't necessarily get in line behind all the other projects that the central data organization has. Ditto for operations, ditto for supply chain. So that's, that's a definitely a trend. As long as there is that collaboration and coordination, you can definitely run those in, a, in an independent organization. The other thing I'll say there is a lot of the companies that we work with, they might start with a discrete function and then grow that project across multiple different domains. So they might start with a logistics project and then they might move into something around supply chain or inventory management. And so there certainly is opportunity to start small and grow and scale over time. Yeah, and I've, I've seen that as well. Maybe it might be supply chain that sponsors it. And as long as they understand and get some input from finance or whatever, so you're not building something that doesn't scale, um, yeah, that'll help you scale down the road. So yeah, agreed there. I love it. Well, that is all the time that we have for this webinar. Brett and Donna, thank you so much for this great presentation. Thanks to Simarkey for sponsoring today's webinar and helping make these webinars happen. And thanks to our attendees, of course, for being so engaged in everything we do. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Ciao.